Light. Huge thrill. We're good to go. We're good to go. Um, thanks, Sarah. So um, I just want to say thanks to everybody uh, on behalf of, uh, for joining us, on behalf of uh, Shepherd University President Mary Hendricks, our uh, Board of Advisors, and our entire uh, staff and, and team. Well, we're going to be discussing with Mr. Kendrick his latest book, Nine Days, The Race to Save Martin Luther King's Life and Win the 1960 Election, and his other books, by the way. Uh, it should be noted that all three books are co-written with his dad, Stephen Kendrick, which could be a whole um, show on itself, is how do you write a book with your father? I think that's pretty cool. You and your son are going to find out <laughs> for his next book. I can just tell you, this is a great book. I've read it and you have signed up everyone on this uh, show for a great ride. We couldn't be happier that Paul agreed to be with us. And nor could we be happier that Peter Loge, by the way, I'm working at home tonight and my cat's crawling all over my <laughs> desk and I don't know how to get rid of her. Her name is Whiskey and I'm just like, Whiskey, please go leave me alone. That may happen to me as well. So hopefully. <laughs> um, but we couldn't be happier that Peter Loge agreed to be our interviewer and our host. Peter is an associate professor and the director of external relations in the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. He's also the founder of the Ethics Project at GW, uh, G, uh, George Washington University. And I'm really happy to say that he's a great member of our Stubblefield Board of Advisors. And now to introduce our guest, as I said before, Paul Kendrick is the co-author with his dad, Stephen, of Nine Days, The Race to Save Martin Luther King Jr.'s Life and Win the 1960 Election. Their book has been chosen as a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice and an Amazon Best Book of the Month. And it's also, I think this is the coolest part for my uh, Debbie and my wife, this really impressed her. It's also on Oprah's Best Book List for February. This father-son team has also written two previous books, Douglas and Lincoln, How a Revolutionary Black Leader and a Reluctant Liberator Struggled to End Slavery and Save the Union, and Sarah's Long Walk, The Free Blacks of Boston and How Their Struggle for equality changed America. Paul served in President Obama's White House and on his 2012 Wisconsin campaign, he earned a Bachelor's of Arts and a Master of Public Administration from the George Washington University. Professor Loge, it is all yours and thank you for agreeing to host our forum tonight. Oh, many thanks, David, for the kind introduction and thank you for the Stubblefield Institute for this and, and everything else you're doing to promote civil political dialogue. Uh, so that we could all use a little bit more of. Um, it is a huge honor to, to be able to talk to Paul tonight. Um, as you heard, Paul has been a, a student of mine um, at the George Washington University. We were sometimes collaborators and co-conspirators. And I see a couple of other co-conspirators on this call as well. Uh, mostly Paul's yeah. a friend, um, which <laughs> is, and it's always very cool to see, to see friends succeed and, and a huge deal to be able to talk to them. Um, I took more notes on the reading in preparation for tonight that I'm guessing Paul did for many of the classes. <laughs> he took me a long time ago. <laughs> Paul was a good student. It was, it was those other students that were bad. Um, as, as David said, Paul's new book is Nine Days, uh, The Race to Save Martin Luther King Jr.'s Life and Win the 1960 Election, which the Washington Post called cinematic, the New York Times called compelling. And as David said, Oprah recommended it, calling it both brilliant and gripping. So check it out. He and his dad's uh, previous books are Douglas and Lincoln and Sarah's Long Walk, uh, which are also terrific and interesting reads. And, and I think there's some themes that run through, through all three that, that I want to touch on this evening. Um, I've got a lot of questions. I've got a lot of notes. Um, but I also know that a lot of people on the call do. So before we get to all of that, uh, I want to do a bit of logistics. And I'm going to turn it over to Paul to set the stage. Uh, if you have questions or ideas or thoughts, please throw them in the chat. Paul and I will will see them. We'll make an effort to get to them. We'll try to make this more of a conversation than, than just a couple of talking heads to the extent we can. Um, and we'll uh, we'll run this, you know, just until about eight o'clock. We'll call it a night. Um, and if you have other questions, you should obviously pick up the book and all of Paul's other books as well. So with that, 
Paul, huge thrill. Why don't you just set the stage, tell us a bit about, about the book, what it's about. Uh, yeah, set it up for us. Yeah, well, thank you so much to the Stubblefield Institute. I, I love what you all are doing and the dialogue you're creating uh, about American politics and David, your leadership and, and just the inclusivity of it, just welcoming people to the family. And so so thank you for welcoming to me to it. Um, so this book began because a neighbor connected me with his mentor, who was former Pennsylvania Senator Harris Wofford, and based on where you all are in West Virginia, in beautiful Martinsburg, uh, you may remember his name uh, from just over there in Pennsylvania. And I started, started spending time in Washington with Harris, and he was in his 80s. And Harris was the link between Martin Luther King and John Kennedy. And so to Harris, the Kennedy brothers and King are not the monumental figures, the statues I think of, they were his friends. They were young men making fast decisions. And my father, who has a good instinct for stories said, well, it seems like you know, Harris, his role in this campaign, how he and his team kind of went rogue to help free Martin Luther King from this perilous imprisonment. And then they shifted the black vote in America that, help, that helped Kennedy win the election, but also give us the political parties we have today. That should be a whole book. Let's fully tell that story. And Harris was really uh, enthusiastic about that. And I got to spend precious hours with him recording these stories. Unfortunately, Harris passed away in 2019. Um, but it, yeah, it makes me feel very lucky to have spent that time with him. And so what we wanted you to do feel as a reader is that you are going through these exciting last days of an election that was so close in so many states around the country and, uh, and at a time that takes you into a world that's a little less familiar. So in 1960, you had the black vote pretty up for grabs. It looked like it might split about 50-50. And Nixon had previously befriended a young Martin Luther King and, and was seen as the more sympathetic candidate uh, to civil rights. The King family was playing, planning to vote for Nixon. And Kennedy was seen as very aloof to civil rights and had very little involvement with the Black community. And so Harris gets put in charge of Black outreach for the Kennedy campaign, uh, working under the Kennedy brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver. And Shriver was viewed as pretty skeptically by his brothers-in-law because he was so passionate and idealistic. But they realized they needed someone to help them do this. And they recruited a character that you'll meet in the book named Louis Martin, who is a Chicago Defender editor. And Louis Martin boldly, audaciously told them how they could win the Black vote. And they were wise enough to listen and empower him. But everything got upended in an October surprise when Martin Luther King is imprisoned three weeks before the 1960 election. And the King you meet in the book is an unfam maybe, well, perhaps more accessible King because he was searching for how he was gonna make national change. He had had the Montgomery bus boycott at age 26. And then four years on, he was really struggling to deliver on the thing people were looking to him now to do, achieve national change and equality in America, civil rights legislation. He moved home to Atlanta in 1960. And at this moment, sit-ins explode throughout the South of, of, of college student activists uh, who took King's civil disobedience, but, but had a new approach. And then they're going to jail. They're putting their bodies on the line to make people focus in on civil rights and have to discuss it. And they felt if their friend Martin Luther King was to go to jail with them, these civil rights, uh, these uh, presidential candidates who are not talking about civil rights will have to address our issue. And so King, in an agonizing decision that we take you through in the book, decided to do that. And we loved getting to know Atlanta student movement activists who who helped us in a very human way understand King in this moment and, and tell for you as the reader vividly what it was like going to jail with him. But they do this sit in, but King has not focused in on the fact that because of a previous traffic violation when he was racially profiled, a judge 
has an excuse to send him to a four month sentence in, in the dangerous Reedsville State Prison in rural Georgia. King is taken in the middle of the night from his jail cell, put in the back of a car, shackled, doesn't understand where he's going, thinks he's going to his death, that he will never see his family again. Um, and so these are the things King was facing down in these nine days that helped him to go on to make, uh, to, to uh, do in Birmingham uh, what was necessary to achieve his mission. But he has to survive these days. And so Coretta King is calling, who became our friend Harris Wofford, saying, they are going to kill Martin. I know they are going to kill him. Uh, Daddy King, Martin's father, is convinced he will be, uh, he could just be you know, assassinated in this prison quietly. King would have been a footnote to history had this happened. And so Harris Wofford gets the Kennedy campaign involved before he can ever uh, get permission from the Kennedy brothers. And, and we take you through what happens from there and how uh, this team, uh, Louis, Martin, Wofford, and Shriver, get Kennedy eventually to call Coretta King, uh, which was a very politically courageous thing to do, but, but was a morally decent thing to do. How through different back channels, they're ultimately able to have Bobby talk to the judge and, and get King out. And then how Louis Martin with this team had the idea to send out a pamphlet, 2 million pamphlets distributed through black communities in the church, telling the story of what Kennedy did and what Nixon didn't. Um, because part of this race is also the Republican side of it. And Nixon's black advisors, Jackie Robinson, and an Eisenhower White House staffer named E. Frederick Morrow, they had a vision for the Republican Party being the party of Black voters, the party of civil rights, and they uh, are in a desperate mission to get Nixon to speak up for his friend and, and, and use this moment to win the Black vote. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of show what, what happens in that. And, uh, but on the King side, um, you know, he endured this with the students and on the Kennedy side, how they were able to shift enough of the Black vote to win nine states um, but because these pamphlets were never focused on by white voters, they were able to hold on to the southern states that Nixon had his eye on flipping from the white Democratic South uh, to the Republican Party. Um, and so it, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting story of how they orchestrated this, um, and, but certainly a story about courage and, and boldness and, and leadership and, and why the Kennedy brothers ultimately did act and Nixon didn't. And it gives us the world we have today. It gives us the political parties we have today, but with a lot of lessons for all of us in our, in our own personal life of, of, of taking risks to speak up and do, um, you know, to speak against injustice and do what's right. Derek, it's a really, it's very uh, concise telling of a really complicated story. And I, I've made some notes, I've got some other questions. But I wanna focus on something that, that you just mentioned that comes through in this book and also your other books. And that is that these are, history is made by people and people acting in moments, right? You talked about it just now, um, people making decisions kind of on the fly. It comes, it's very clear in the book, you got a bunch of people who really shouldn't be in charge of anything, who are <laughs> making decisions without telling yeah. anybody and putting people like John Kennedy on the spot. Uh, you, you talk about, um, I, won't, I won't reveal it, but why Daddy King ended up voting in the presidential the way he did. And it was a personal decision. It was about a phone call that was made and a phone call that wasn't made wasn't grandstanding, it wasn't anything else. Just now you're talking about the conversations you had with, with the student leaders, right? Who were, some of whom were lucky enough are still around. You do the same thing in Sarah's Long Walk and the same thing in Douglas and Lincoln. You portray in Sarah's Long Walk, it's the story of a little girl and her dad who, and she wanted to go to school. So talk about the importance, if you would, you, you also think this is before, this is a human uh, king. This isn't the legend king that we all know. Um, John Kennedy was an unknown American politician at that point, one of his challenges, he had two big challenges, he was Catholic and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> so talk about the role of just, like the, the, the humanness of all of these stories. Mm, yeah, well, West Virginia is a big reason why Kennedy got the nomination. He went down there and, and people really embraced him. And, um, but the human, I mean, in politics, the human gesture is really important. And in this case, so when, when Harris was so upset that Coretta King had called him about, and she, Coretta King was pregnant, um, her husband is in danger. And so he, 
says, you know, let's just go get a beer. And so he and Louis went to a place called Harvey's that's near where the Mayflower Hotel is today in DC, uh, where they would go for beer and some oysters. And, and, you know, they're talking about press releases. They had drafted some press releases that hadn't gotten out when Louis wanted to try, try to, uh, Louis saw this as an advantage for the campaign. The Kennedy leadership of the campaign saw it as a huge liability and risk that was going to cost them white voters. No one was focused on black voters mattering except uh, Louis and Harrison Shriver. And so, uh, but, but Harris is like, what if, what if Kennedy just called Coretta King and, 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 and Louis Martin just jumped on that idea of like, that would make a big difference to people. They had seen Adelaide Stevenson lose two straight elections to Eisenhower uh, because, you know, he was just uh, very kind of like wonky and, and intellectual, but just couldn't do the human thing. And that matters a lot in politics. And so Shriver drives out to O'Hare Airport. He waits till the, what they call the Irish Mafia, the, the inner circle of the Kennedy campaign leaves the room. And he presents this idea to his brother-in-law. And because he knows it would get shot down because again, he's seen as the, 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 the idealist with poor judgment. Um, but Kennedy just thinks it's a nice, uh, Kennedy did not think this was gonna change the world. He just thought, oh, well, that's a good thing. That's a decent thing to do. And we should try to do the decent thing, you know, not without all these calculations of, of you know, how it might rebound for us. Uh, and uh, so Kennedy makes this call to Coretta. You know, people like Andrew Young, who we interviewed said, you know, nothing like that was done at the time of a, you know, a white politician calling, uh, you know, the family of a controversial civil rights leader who's in jail for civil disobedience. And again, people were still understanding this whole thing of like, wait, they're breaking the law on purpose and they're going into dangerous jail. Like, we're so used to that. There's people at the time, people were like, why are they doing, I heard Gandhi did that, but why, why are people doing that, you know, here? And so Kennedy calls Coretta, um, but uh, but but the Kennedy brothers also they weren't satisfied with a gesture and that's and so you find out in the story how they end up kind of out mavericking the maverick trio because then they actually they don't just want a sentimental thing they're like all right well we're, we're involved in this we didn't really want to get involved but these you know these two white liberals and and the you know black editor from Chicago gotten us involved in it let's solve this uh, they didn't say that I'm kind of uh, this is Harris's understanding of their thinking and uh, and so they work behind the scenes to get King out, but you know, but Louis Martin, because he had worked for the Chicago Defender, he had a good instinct for how to tell a story. And of course, in political communication, we know it's it's about how you frame these things. And so, who knows how this would have affected the election if he didn't say, "I got to get this story to micro target it." There wasn't a word for it then, but I got to get this to the voters that need to hear it. And uh, and Shriver, to his credit, was like, "All right." Well, I'm not going to even tell my brothers-in-law. Let's just do it, and I'll give you the money to do it, and let's let's make it happen. And you know, there is something amazing in campaigns where a quick idea, where boldness, where um, but but it does take in a campaign team when the stakes are the highest, being willing to trust the experiences of others. And Nixon was not willing to trust Jackie Robinson and Frederick Morrow, who were telling him what they thought he needed to do for King. Um, and I, I do think there is a lesson there of, uh, yeah, when the, when the chips are down, are, are we really willing to listen? And, and Shriver and Wofford were, um, but, but I think throughout the story and how the activists approached it, and you, you talked about our first book, Sarah's Long Walk, and, and which was about a five-year-old black girl having to walk past five white schools. Um, and then in this story, how these students, college students, Spellman, Morehouse students, uh, how they went to Rich's department store and the Magnolia Tea Room, the, 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 the nicest place in Atlanta, dressed like they were going to church and just asked to be served. And there were a lot of people hostile to that at the time or that were scolding about their tactics, but, but they were trying to illustrate something um, uh, that would, uh, over time, over the civil rights movement, over those months and years that followed, was able to change a lot of American hearts and minds because, it, it, again, it creates a moral theater. It, it, it makes us think of something differently. It forces an issue and it, uh, you know, and activates a, a certain moral high ground um, that, that did ultimately, you know, again, through Birmingham, uh, and, and King's continued activism would change public will, would 
finally get Kennedy to embrace pushing civil rights legislation. So I think always in politics, we have to remember emotion uh, and how we key into that. But for someone like Louis Martin, it wasn't just for the sake of winning. He wanted to win because he wanted to achieve equality in America. He wanted to uh, move the mountain of racism, as he called it. He wanted to achieve civil rights gains. He wanted to put a black man on the Supreme Court, that he, which he was able to do with Thurgood Marshall. So, so all these things we have to remember in politics, uh, that you know, they, they, they do help reveal character about and something we want to communicate about our campaign. Um, but it is for the ideals that we're seeking to advance, uh, you know, ideally. <laughs> um, and it certainly was for this team that's at the heart of the book. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, so, you know, again, in 2021, you know, we look back on the Kennedys as the liberal line of the Senate with a white Senator Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, champion of civil rights, John Kennedy. But at the time you make it clear in the book that basically the civil rights movement was a problem to be solved, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, John Kennedy didn't run for president um, on a civil rights platform. As you said, President Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon uh, were way out front on that. Um, so the Kennedys kind of wanted to make this go away and activists and a couple of folks on their own team, as you know, sort of made it a problem to be solved. Does that diminish the value? Because it was a, it was a political ploy, right? Kennedy got, the, got yeah. the politics right, Nixon got the politics wrong. Neither were deeply invested in the issue at this point. If anybody's invested, Nixon was more invested in civil rights than Kennedy was. Does that diminish this? Or is there a lesson in there that the expedient, the virtuous and the expedient can sometimes align? Hmm. Yeah, I think what, um, well, what can be morally courageous can be politically courageous and, uh, or, or, uh, and, and King actually said this in a, um, his JFK library, uh, oral history interview, but he talked about how what can be politically smart may also be the moral thing. And so, and I think, you know, Kennedy had such a, a lively strategic mind that I think he could hold these two thoughts in his head. But again, I want to emphasize how um, politically explosive it was to do it so so that it wasn't an obvious thing. So so going back a little, um, what's important to know about Harris Wofford, uh, who was, again, the person that our entry point into the story, he had been... A, he went to a, a black law school and he was from a, a well-to-do white family in New York. And his grandmother fainted when she, when he said, I'm going to Howard law school. And, and he was obsessed with Gandhiism. He had, his grandmother had actually taken him to India as a, as a kid. Uh, and, and then he went return with his wife and he won, he thought this could change the American caste system, but he, but he wanted to live in the black community first, not just say, I'm, I have all this answers and this change. Like, wanted to like understand, uh, be part of a uh, community outside of his experiences. And so, and when he heard a minister in Montgomery was using these tactics, he started writing to Martin Luther King. I have to, you know, I have to befriend him. And, and he became an advisor to King. And I give you that context because Harris had this other career as a, as a lawyer and a, a, a foreign policy uh, thinker that got him onto the Kennedy campaign but his heart is with King. So his, he is determined to create this linkage. And he arranged for a couple meetings uh, before all this between King and Kennedy. And King is just saying, you know, I just don't feel that Kennedy has any emotional connection to this. I want him to, uh, to, to, to feel viscerally uh, what, you know, how racism affects our lives. Um, and so, 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 so people wanted to see that from Kennedy, and, but, but Wofford believed Kennedy had the capacity for growth, that he understood prejudice against the Irish and, and, and he could, that he could get there. And, and so that's why Harris is pushing him to act in this moment. And, um, but you know, as to what his motives were, um, you know, I, I, it's ultimately a, a test. I mean, I think uh, activists can create tests for politicians uh, to, to really see where they're at. And are, are, because ultimately if we elect someone, there are going to be tough calls they need to make. And uh, one thing someone said is at the time, black voters, uh, they were just looking to who was gonna disappoint them less. They were, right. they, they were so used to getting so little, um, but, but if Kennedy could, could show something, it might reveal that he would push for civil rights. But 
then Wofford and, and Martin after the election have to really keep pushing on Kennedy to get behind civil rights. So I do think, you know, Kennedy, his passion was in foreign policy. Uh, he was, he did, he wouldn't have talked about civil rights if these young activists, young people forced, forced the issue. They got their emergingly famous friend arrested with them. Now you got to talk about it. And so, so it's a lesson for activists that, that, you know, Hey, politicians might, they're, they're happy to sometimes avoid the controversial stuff. You know, we, we have to, to, to make them engage on it and the public grapple with things that are wrong, uh, but they might be used to. And, uh, and, and so Kennedy had to do that. And, and even though he kind of then put civil rights on the back burner, Harris was working in the White House, not having anyone talk to him for a couple of, for a year. Uh, he was so discouraged, he asked to go work on, on the Peace Corps full time and uh, go off to Africa. But when King created uh, uh, the Birmingham campaign and, and, and you have children being attacked by dogs, that was what finally got Kennedy behind civil rights and, and Louis Martin in meetings in the White House was, was saying, you have to take action that's clear to people. Uh, so, you know, events can be incredible forcing mechanisms to clarify stakes in an election um, and uh, to help us know, you know, who is this candidate. So you actually, you actually quote Dr. King um, and your book is saying the dearth of positive leadership from Washington is not confined to one political party. Each of them has been willing to follow the long pattern of using the Negro as a political football. And so, mm -hmm. so the young Martin Luther King went in with his eyes wide open and the older daddy King was playing the pragmatist and, yeah. and up until the end was a Nixon supporter. And part of, as you point out, part of the King family's reluctance to support Kennedy is that Kennedy was Catholic. And, yeah. and they weren't the, sure they yeah. could really trust. Uh, yeah, trust and president. they were just Republicans. I mean, right. because they were persecuted by people that were Democrats. <laughs> you know, the yeah. Georgia governor Vandiver uh, was a Democrat, you know, Alabama's, you know, George Wallace, Democrat, like, you know, that, that was their experience with Democrats. So, uh, so Daddy King did say I wouldn't vote for him because he was a Catholic uh, until he, until he said, but he wiped the tear from my daughter's eyes. So uh, I, you know, I will vote for him. Um, but I think he was, he would, we wouldn't have voted for him anyway. I mean, uh, King, you know, they, the Kings would have all voted Republican. And so I, I do think there is a, um, uh, I think it's interesting for people to learn about the black Republican advisors in the book, because they really had a vision that can still be taken up. Um, but, uh, but they had a vision for their party uh, that, that Nixon didn't hear, uh, but that would have built on that moment where the Kennedys are, uh, the Kings, I mean, the day before King's arrested, Daddy King is doing another Republican event. He is a proud Republican like uh, these Atlanta black leaders who had uh, against this Jim Crow South had, had built an incredible community in Atlanta. Um, but, but King Jr., as you said, was very conscious of not being taken advantage of by these politicians, not being used uh, for them to get more votes he wanted a moral pedestal beyond partisan politics where he could say, you know, what's right and push for those things, call people out on what's wrong. Um, and so he did not want to be partisan and he did not actually endorse Kennedy after all this because he, he really wanted to. But as he talked about the story of what had just happened when he was at the gates of Reedsville when he has been released and it's one of my favorite scenes in the book, um, but you know, but he credits Kennedy. But part of what we also wanted to get across in this story or in this book was there were a lot of people involved in getting King out from his brave lawyer, Donald Hollowell, who's an amazing character who, who went through the backwoods of Georgia defending black clients and, uh, and, and really in the, the trial scene in this, in the book, uh, really put segregation on trial when this uh, prejudice judge wanted to use the technicality of motor vehicle laws to get this uh, rabble rouser King sent, sent away. Um, Hollowell, the students uh, who, who loved King, who King had supported and listened to, and, and they got it, they, they pressured him into going to jail, and then they're worried, and they told me this, like, oh no, we're going to get our friend killed, we, you know, we're not with him, we can't protect him anymore, and Coretta King, so uh, we wanted all of them to, to come through in the story, but certainly King had a great savviness uh, that he was not going to be co-opted, uh, but the fact that one candidate spoke up and one didn't, he was going to put that out there. Um, and then, you know, once Kennedy was elected, he was going to try to keep pushing uh, to get the civil rights legislation that he was striving for. 
So I think we're moving into a couple of, of uh, themes when I draw through your books and also to the current moment. Um, and I also at some point want you to, to talk about how you know all this stuff, right? How you did your research. But I do, when you, when you talk, be, think about that as you answer the question though, you said, you said there are a lot of people involved, a lot of people we may not have heard of. Um, and one of the things you note in the book, which is also something we're hearing today is the role of black women in this. You write, like you lead a section with women had been central to the movement from the start. Ms. Bellman students in particular more than made their share of Committee for Appeal to Human Rights in Atlanta. Um, and it's also worth noting that the Vice President of the United States went to an HBCU, went to Howard University. So can you talk about the, the role of, of women and also in doing that, a question from the crowd. Uh, how did you, how do you know all this stuff? What's your source material? Yeah, it, that was part of what we wanted to bring across in a story that to the extent that it had been told, people just focus on Kennedy and, and maybe Nixon. Um, we really wanted to make sure people understood that the heart of the organizing of the Atlanta student movement had come through brave women. And when they were doing nonviolence training, you had football players saying, you know what, I'm out because if someone hits me, I'm going to hit back. And, 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 and women from Spellman who had the discipline to say, you know, we're going to change Jim Crow, we will go to jail. And these, you know, straight A students whose parents had dreamed of, you know, sending their daughter to, to a college, uh, who their, their parents are getting threats in their hometown, they could be thrown out of school. I mean, they, they went to jail in the Jim Crow South. And, and then women uh, had uh, a particular kind of terror inflicted on them because there were sexual assaults from guards in these uh, jails that the Atlanta students were put in. Um, and so their bravery, I, I think, really must be remembered in a civil rights movement that, you know, um, we think about Martin Luther King and, and, and he, Martin Luther King is such a hero, uh, but he would be the first to give credit to a lot of them that sometimes then get forgotten about in if, if we see the civil rights movement as just a tale about Martin Luther King, um, but, but they put their uh, bodies and, and, and lives on the line, they took that risk. Uh, because change can only come through doing the things that that make us uncomfortable and that are bold. Um, so, yeah. So we wanted we got some you know some of those stories are in the book, and in terms of how we told the the book, um, so it it was such an honor to get to spend time with Atlanta student movement veterans uh, like the leader of it, Lonnie King, uh, who unfortunately also passed away in two thousand nineteen. Um, but Charles Black and Otis Moss and uh, other surviving leaders. Um, and so those interviews gave great vividness to the book. And then also particularly on the Kennedy campaign side, Louis Martin's daughters uh, helped you as the reader get to know who he was, this colorful personality, uh, this uh, savvy newspaper editor. Uh, there's a wealth of oral histories that we drew on from the Kennedy Library and, and uh, other sources. The newspapers, I mean, I, I want you to feel like you lived October 19th, 1960. And so we really tried to bring Atlanta to life in that moment. Um, and uh, so a lot of work in the newspapers to, to tell this day by day. And then we found some cool discoveries. So in the lawyer Donald Hollowell's papers that had just gotten opened at an Atlanta public library, the Sweet Auburn Library, was the trial transcript of, uh, that allowed us to tell that scene and had the testimony that allows us to tell the scene of the sit-in of what King said when he goes and tries to, to go into the Magnolia Room. So, uh, so that was... Uh, really incredible as well of, of um, some of these these discoveries on the way. But, you know, there's a lot of this primary source stuff uh, to tell this in, um, people say it reads novelistically, and that came out of a lot of work because there's nothing made up. So we had to find it all. And, uh, but to allow you to feel like you're there, that uh, one review said it feels like you're, you know, a fly on the wall listening. Um, that's the quality we wanted to have. Um, but it, it, it certainly started with Harris and realizing if we don't record this, um, you know, and then with the Atlanta student movement veterans, like we don't want this history to be lost. It hurts to be losing our civil rights leaders and, and you just want to try to, to record it and get it on paper. Uh, and so it was a real joy to do that. So I, this this is a good segue to, to how this book and your other books situate in time, right? And so Sarah's Long Walk, little girl once again leading the movement, right? Um, the women you, you write about, um, certainly, you know, look at the bus boycott, 
right? That was a woman who refused to, to move to the back of the bus. You look at desegregation of schools after mm -hmm. Brown v. the Board of Education. We all know the painting of the, the Norman Rockwell painting of the little girl. Um, but this also says to me that, like, we've seen this movie before. You know, when I read Sarah's Long Walk, I went to college in Boston, I uh, read Sarah's Long Walk, and these, these debates against school segregation from the 1800s sound really familiar, mm -hmm. right? In reading Douglas and Lincoln, thinking these arguments about the political expedient, what is right, what is the expedient mass is what's right, this all sounds familiar. And I was reading Nine Days on the heels of um, BLM, right? All of this sounds familiar. I reread the late John Lewis's speech at the March on Washington in 1968, right? I mean, on one hand, it, I'm reading this and it's, it's amazing. On the other hand, I'm getting really frustrated thinking we are still having this conversation. And yet I wanna be optimistic because in his inaugural address, President Biden looked at the vice president and said, don't tell me things can't change. So mm. is this the same movie again and again? Are we getting better? Like help, help, help us understand how this is all contextualized in history. And of course, as somebody points out in a question, the 1960 campaign, when does this set up then Nixon's Southern strategy? And then like, You've got this effect coming out, right? Where now, you know, it's shocking when when Democrats win win the South and get more than ten percent of the black vote. Help us understand how this fits in your writing and and where we are in twenty twenty one. And we've wow, got plenty. Of, so we've got like twenty minutes. So, <laughs> uh, so our three books all have this theme of hopeful moments of interracial collaboration in history. Uh, I believe we need to turn back to those moments, not in a sentimental way, uh, but to know it is possible that we that there are effective ways, things we can learn to work across racial lines together uh, as we take forward this mission for an equal America. And so uh, it, in, in Sarah's Long Walk, there was these two lawyers, the first black lawyer in American history, Robert Morris and Charles Sumner, the, the Senator, uh, later the Senator, then we wrote about Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And then in this one, this team on the Kennedy campaign. Um, so there were, yeah, a lot of echoes of what was going on, you know, especially as we finished the final edits of this book, because the 1960 campaign, you have the sit-in movement happening that kind of upends the campaign. Um, in 2020, you have Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, it, which was gave both candidates a chance to how they wanted to respond to calls for racial equality, and they made really different. Uh, well, and I also, to also want, to, yeah. want to point out that Senator Romney marched with the BLM protesters here in Washington, D.C., and on social media put out a picture of his father marching with civil mm, rights leaders yeah. in the 1960s. So it's, it's like it's a real parallel. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think obviously there are. Um, and, and it was fascinating to find some newspaper articles from relatively, from pretty moderate um, Atlanta paper, from the Atlanta Journal Constitution, where they were like, you know, we, we agree with some of the students' aims, but this approach of doing these sit-ins, it's very disruptive, it's very counterproductive. And it, and it did make me think about the ways that sometimes uh, we would be better served to listen to young people and why they're calling out urgently to address uh, a wrong and 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 an inequality, um, but you know, just sometimes we're just quick to jump to judgment uh, about how they're doing it. And so it was fascinating to me of you know that happening then about leaders who now seem uncontroversial, but then were. Um, but I think you know, yeah, as long as we see ways that people are treated unequally, um, that <laughs> that it calls us to take action and 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 to do things that that may be uncomfortable, but to get us out of our comfort zones, um, to 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 do work that, uh, that for our common good. Um, and I think there are a lot of examples of the characters in this book doing that. And you know, John Lewis would say, if, if you know, if you don't believe there's progress, walk a day in my shoes. Um, you know, John Lewis, who uh, interestingly in this book, in the that fall was like. I'm not interested in either of these candidates. And then he ends up spending the rest of his life as a you know, politician. So it, it did show of you know, these shifts that happen um, where he found the vehicle to make civil rights change. But, but, um, but again, one but, of the last photographs of, of John Lewis um, was standing the on the, on the Matter Plaza, Plaza, yeah. Matter Plaza in, in Washington, yeah. D.C. Yeah, so, so again, I think we can learn from inspiring moments of history 
that will help us stand up uh, and speak up um, when they're, you know, in the ways that inequalities are with us today, uh, as we work for this more perfect union, as we work for for equality, and um, you know, you, you raise the the, the uh, Nixon Southern strategy piece, and it's um, so he went down to Georgia in August 1960 for a rally, and again, the Democrats have been winning the the South for a generation, but he sees hundreds of thousands of people down Peachtree Street, all through downtown. And we do think there was, um, and, and he'd had these years of building up relationships with someone like King and, you know, Jackie Robinson believes in him. But I, I do think there was an element of being seduced of, um, I can win those voters and to do it, I will no longer associate with these other voters. Um, and, you know, that kind of broke Jackie Robinson's heart. And, and by 1968, he really denounces Nixon. And so, you know, again, I think that's a shame, uh, but uh, that, that Nixon kind of made those choices when, uh, but, but there is this, like I said, this vision Robinson had for the GOP that, uh, of one that really competes on civil rights and, and the ideas for, you know, who, who has the best program for Black America um, and, uh, and, and really treats these voters as they matter. And, um, and so, you know, that, that can be taken up. And then on the Democratic side, you know, the, the Democrats, you know, can't be complacent with, okay, they win 90% of the vote, but are they addressing those issues? And now we have a new administration like they did in 1960 when Kennedy was elected but they had to keep pushing to prioritize the issues uh, that, you know, that were Louis Martin's hopes and dreams, that were Martin Luther King's hopes and dreams uh, to be able to achieve. So there's, you know, obviously there's a civil rights agenda today that we, we hope to advance and, uh, you know, and, and, and we hope everyone, you know, I hope people can find ways to be involved in, in how they are moving that forward. Um, even if, you know, there's going to be disagreement of ideas of this, th you know, this way to do it, that way to do it, this this piece of legislation or that one, but fundamentally like, you know, all kind of working together um, in this American project of, of how we make a multiracial democracy, how everyone who wants to vote is able to vote and, uh, and, and how, uh, you know, people are treated equally by their government. So I, you and I both had the honor of working for, for President Obama. Um, and the next Democratic administration has another, another uh, Black person in, in the vice presidential role. So, is this sort of slow halting progress because people continue to hold power accountable and put justice ahead of party, like a, a senator like Senator Scott of South Carolina, who's an unapologetic conservative? Like, is, are we so are we actually making progress that way? Is the problem when we say, aha, we elected the black guy, we're fine now? Like, help me help me sort through this moment. <laughs> yeah, sort of that. Well, you know, I, I gave that example of what John Lewis said, but yeah, obviously, John Lewis was was not satisfied that he, he spent to his last day uh, working for uh, you know how uh, Americans' lives everyone can feel treated equally that, that, and, and know that is true, um, how that can be lived, how our ideals are the reality of people's experiences. And so um, you know I, I, I just think for all of us it's you know it's not for me to say of uh, we're making this person. I think it's for all of us to listen to people who have different perspectives um, and uh, and understand and 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 to better develop our own sense of what are the things that America can do better. And and I think that the characters in this book who listened uh, were much more successful in their outcomes, and it, and that was a gratifying thing. Uh, one thing we found in the Nixon Library is after the election, uh, one of his advisors. Because we're trying to figure out, like, well, how did Nixon emotionally process this? And um, because he had an Ebony interview later where he talks about, you know, well, I, I just didn't understand, but, you know, I didn't think it was appropriate to do this, and I, I could have won, and then I, I, I want us to win Black vote. And, you know, he, he seemed kind of tortured over it. And, but in his uh, files, because um, we'd found all these telegrams of Black leaders asking him to speak out, that his advisor wrote him a memo of, you know, maybe you should uh, send a letter back to everyone who communicated with you and say, well, I'm so glad King is out. And, uh, you know, I hope we can make progress and some different things. And he just scrolled back, no. And so I do think he was really, 
um, you know, this, this changed something in him. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, I, but, but he didn't listen <laughs> to what people were telling him. And so I, I just think there's a, a real list, lesson in there and how Shriver and Wofford did to Louis Martin um, and how ultimately, even though the Kennedy brothers did not want to get involved in this politically explosive situation uh, that they did listen, we have to listen today. Um, and, and we have to, uh, there's just realities being experienced beyond our own and like, and, and we will create a richer civic and uh, common life uh, and, and, and our actions in our daily life if, if we're taking in these perspectives. You know, you, the listening piece is really interesting because you, you write at, at one point in the book that, that the young John Kennedy said something like, I just never met any black people. Yeah, you know, yeah, he, he hadn't. This, he grew up in this privileged yeah. New England um, environment and, and Vice President Nixon grew up working class and, and a Quaker and was always kind of the, you know, he wasn't the one who's expected to succeed. Um, and yeah, he was an underdog, was, yeah. Over the career of, of Bobby Kennedy and then, then um, Senator yeah. Kennedy, they became real civil rights heroes. And is that a function yeah. of them willing to say, okay, I get it, I'm gonna listen now? It really is, I think, in Bobby Kennedy's case. Um, and the epilogue is in the book is about uh, King's funeral and and you can see how far Bobby has gone from the pretty obnoxious young man that Harris Wofford meets at the start and Harris Wofford's like oh my gosh <laughs> and Louis Martin thinks he's gonna get fired by Bobby Kennedy I mean he, but uh, but experience Bobby had strong emotions about what was right and wrong and when he was exposed to things he had a he developed a real capacity for growth and so you that some of that is, is in this book and ultimately how he calls this judge to help get King out and really earns Louis's uh, kind of respect and love. Um, so so he, yeah, he was able to do that. And I think that that is a lesson for all of us, uh, certainly about uh, kind of about the, the ability to take in new, uh, new understandings of things uh, that will, you know, guide, guide our actions. Um, yeah, so you know we can we can see that in the story of Bobby King, uh, <laughs> Bobby Kennedy, uh, quite a lot. Yeah, and of course West Virginia played a tremendous role in, in Bobby Kennedy's growth uh, when he toured West yeah. Virginia, and that really helped guide who who he was. And when I worked for Senator Kennedy, um, this was always front. It was people got to pay attention to people. Um, mm. So I, I, the, I have so many other questions. One I just have to ask. It's unrelated to the others, but I, I have to ask it before before I get to some others. Why do you, what drew you and your dad to write about? So now your dad's a minister, yeah. he's retiring. Yeah. Congratulations to your dad on that. What, and you've been writing these books now, I put it over there for, for a while. What led you and your father to, to, to write yeah, three books in a row about civil rights? Yeah. Um, and I have one more thought on your last question I want to yeah. say that um, uh, I was really grateful that a black friend read the book before it was published to give me some feedback, see if it, did I get something wrong here. And she had a great comment where I had written a line where I just said, Kennedy had not been exposed to uh, many black people. And she was like, well, that's kind of a choice. He's a grown up, like he could have exposed himself to it. And it was like such a good catch. And it, which I, I think is also instructive for all of it. Like there's no excuses. Like, yeah, we can have experiences, you know, beyond uh, what we're, what we may have grown up with. Um, you know, we can get out there and, and I think there's characters in this book that show how to, how to do that best. But in terms of my father and I, um, it all began because we were at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, that is in the Lorraine Motel where King was assassinated. If you uh, can get there at some point in your life, for those that haven't been, it's a really emotional experience to be in that room in his last moments. Um, but there's a timeline of civil rights there. And one of the first things was uh, the case Roberts versus the city of Boston, the first school desegregation case in 1849. And we thought that before the civil war, that's amazing. Uh, and it happened in the neighborhood my father lives in in Boston. And so we just started learning more about the community. And we thought, well, that has a great national resonance. And my father had, um, had written on religion and some other things, but had not done history. And so we worked well together because I have a real hunger to dig into the archives and, and uh, the, the newspapers and, and do a lot of this research. And, and he, I think, is a is great, uh, lively prose writer. And, 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 uh, but we both have a real love of characters and, and story structure. And, and so that's 
how we got into it, but but we did develop this theme of um, yeah, things that we can learn. You know, for all of us as you know, people that want to make positive change in America, what what is history we can turn to that gives us, that can guide us, that can give us insights, um, and that can inspire us to to know um, that that it is possible. Uh, to do good. Um, and, and so we wanted to tell some stories like that, that we thought were not uh, fully into, um, you know, the, the, the public awareness, whether that's, you know, for us, Frederick Douglass being like our Mandela in America, but, but how Lincoln listened to him and how they had this really incredible relationship even it was just in three meetings between an activist and a politician, uh, but also the push and pull there. Um, and then in this story, I think captured so much of, uh, of, of, those, of those values in just telling the history and, and here's, here's how it happened. And here's the change that Shriver and Wofford and Martin go on to make as they continue, as they you know, advance civil rights, as, as Shriver founds the Peace Corps with Wofford, as Shriver founds the Special Olympics, like these are real change makers, um, but they, they, they did it as, as lifelong friends. Uh, we thought was a, that's a very moving thing. There is not enough of that um, in you know, a country that remains you know, very divided. And, and so you know, let, let, let's try to look to stories like this, not to be sentimental per se, uh, not, but, but with clear eyes, uh, about what it takes uh, to make change. Well, that that's actually leads into a really good good question. As we begin to wind down the hour, we're at a university, we're at Shepherd University, lovely, lovely little place. I look forward to being able to go back there yeah. when, when we get uh, all vaccinated. Um, you've got students obviously interested in in politics. Um, some because they always have been. Some because of of BLM or the election or the insurrection a few weeks ago or. What advice do you give to, to young men and women at, at Shepherd and universities around the country? And you've also built a career in this, right? I mean, David, sort of, yeah. your bio is incredibly long, helped run the Harlem Children's Zone, senior role uh, at, at the, in the Obama administration, you run a political yeah. organization, but you started this as, you know, a kid in college in Washington. So what advice do you have to the next generation of Paul Kendricks? Oh, they'll, they'll exceed me. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll do more than I have. But um, yeah, I think, you know, King had real reservations about going to jail, uh, as anyone reasonably would. And, um, and he had like, like anxiety uh, about solitary confinement. I mean, really, uh, you know, what he went through, he called it worse than dying you know, this first experience of going through it. And I'm not saying that we need to do that, but we can do something that scares us. I think we can do something that we're a little afraid to do. Um, and, uh, and as far as, you know, how we do make you know, social change, how we do uh, create a, a real equality in America, I think it does require us uh, doing those things. These students forced an issue. They made people have to grapple with it and process it and think about it. the things that people had all grown up with in Georgia. Um, you know, the students put on display uh, a, a way that would allow Americans to really consider it. And so, you know, what, what are those um, uh, you know, unhealed uh, and um, unmet uh, needs that we have in America that, that we can make sure uh, are elevated uh, to, to, to engage people in that work and to, to welcome them into it. Um, but it might require us being uncomfortable when we do it, um, but, uh, but to do those things, uh, to listen as, as we do, uh, we should not be afraid to like step forward and, and take that action and to show up and to get involved. Um, and, and so, you know, I mean, I can talk all day about some of the, the career stuff, but I think just in drawing on the history and what it tells us today, yeah, we just gotta go, go do the thing that scares us. So the other side of that is of course, people like you, me, and I know some of the other folks on this call are not undergraduates any longer. <laughs> and some of us, you know, um, work on or run campaigns. What lessons should we take, those of us in charge? Mm. Yeah. Um, so, well, sorry if this is repetitive from an earlier answer, but but the, the certainly the, the, the listening when 
uh, when we think, you know, we just want to trust our own judgment, but like really like understanding there's a, there's a superpower in a diverse team of people that have experienced different things and have other perspectives. And so uh, really being able to trust that um, and, and, you know, even if it might be not be our first inclination, even if we might kind of jump to, to question it, like to, to really sit with these things and hear them um, as uh, the Kennedy campaign civil rights team was able to do with Louis Martin, I think for those that are working on campaigns or in any organization you were really well served to do that and and king did that with the students because again uh you know king's father was saying we um hey we got a good thing going in atlanta you focus on the backwoods of of georgia don't disturb things here and the students said no we don't have a quality here so we need you to kind of upset the apple cart and and create the you know it's going to be some specific strikes but we need you to do that so but king backed the students he didn't try to commandeer their movement and take it away, um, but just support them. So, so I think, yeah, the ability to listen to young people, to listen to, to you know, people across racial lines and, and have different experiences in all ways uh, is really crucial, I think, on a campaign. And then just not being afraid to be bold. I just think we play it safe a lot uh, in campaigns. We play by the same playbook. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, I think boldness can be rewarded in politics. And, and Louis Martin's boldness was based on something. He, he had a real strategy to it. It wasn't kind of recklessness for the sake of it. Um, but when he really knew what this was going to take, he wasn't afraid to do it, even though, yeah, the, you know, the campaign leadership would have said, that's risky. We got a strategy. We're all good. But in an election where everything made a difference in an election that close, what, what Louis Martin, the civil rights team did, uh, you know, ends up making a difference uh, in states that over and over were just decided by a few thousand votes. So what they did made that difference. And when Louis was home watching in Chicago uh, that night, you know, he could know that he had uh, helped elect a president. You know, it, it's interesting. You, you write at one point that the problem of the civil rights movement for the Kennedys was it was unpredictable. <laughs> and and yeah. we've both run campaigns. Um, yeah. The prizes right. are bad. Predictability is your friend. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like one yeah. of the lessons is um, that's OK. Be, be comfortable with a level of unpredictability. And I think we saw this in the Obama campaign, certainly saw in the, in the Trump campaign and some of the other Democratic primary campaigns. Just let people do what they think is the right thing to do. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, Matt, who was on this call, uh, your friend Matt Peruto, like he had a good lesson for this towards the end of this fast campaign where he's like, you know, telling candidates, like find, find something that shows who you are. Don't just like say it. Uh, well, this is a good lesson in anything in life, but like, don't just say you are this thing, but like, you know, bring these uh, certain two people together in your community and like, like create that visual, like, like be able to tell a story um, but, but that doesn't just, um, that is, that, that, that will be memorable, that, that, that will stick with us. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I think that is really, so when unpredictable things happen in politics, be ready to use your moral core, um, and, and do the thing that is right that, uh, and, uh, and it may take some political courage, but if it's, if it's morally courageous, um, and, uh, and it is authentic and it, and it shows heart, uh, then, then that can really, you know, that people want that. Great, great lessons. In the remaining minute or two, what else should we be reading? Now, this is a surprise question we didn't talk about, but mm. what else should should folks here be reading? I finished I finished all of your books. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I got to pick up something else, Paul. Um, I mean, I think a great civil rights book that helped us see helps America see things differently is at the dark end of the street. Um, that is about how Rosa Parks was not just a symbol. Uh, stoically sitting on a bus. She had been a investigator into rapes that were happening of black women and uh, that, you know, was part of the strategy of terror against civil rights. So I think that's a great civil rights book. Um, you know, there's so many great memoirs from the civil rights movement. I got some of them right here. I mean, Andrew <laughs> Young's an easy burden. Um, I, you know, John Lewis is walking with the wind, Coretta Scott King's My Life, My Love, My Legacy, uh, the autobiography that was created of Martin Luther King by Dar Dr. Clayson, uh, Clay <laughs> Dr. Claiborne Carson um, uh, from his writings. You know, read King's writings. I mean, you know, it, it's such a brilliant, brilliant ability. And read the Birmingham letter from Birmingham jail. You know, the way that King constructs these arguments is so powerful, calls on us to do more. You're like, you know, you you are, you 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 want to uh, take that, carry that legacy forward. Um, so, you know, I think those are, um, you know, from a civil rights front, uh, 
you know, some, some great books uh, that, uh, you know, I think, and especially if you read this story that, you know, you want to learn more about these characters, their, their full lives. Uh, those are, those are some real good places to start. Great, great recommendations. Um, and we've hit just about an hour. Thank you so much, Paul. I've, I've learned a tremendous amount. It's been a huge amount of fun. Thank you all for joining us this evening. For those of you who asked questions in the chat, I think we got to them all. Um, thank you to the Subblefield Institute, David, Sarah. Um, really great fun. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Peter and, and Dave and Sarah for all your work on, on the event at the Subfield Institute. You all are doing an incredible thing. So really appreciate you having me uh, and look forward to, to staying in touch in any ways I can help. And Bill Subblefield of the Subblefield Institute is with us. He's going to be mad at me for calling him out, but I have to applaud him for all of his vision and hard work. So thank you. Well, thank you for making all this possible. Good night, everybody. Good night.